doctora Guida Rubio Frusetti obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de Nevada y en Reno. Actualmente trabaja como directora asociada de la clínica ambulatoria para adolescentes de este, en el cual ofrece terapia dialéctica conductual en McLean Hospital. Ha entrenado a profesionales de la salud a través de Estados Unidos y Suecia en el uso de la terapia dialéctica conductual en parejas, padres y familiares. Ha trabajado ofreciendo supervisión clínica en dicho modelo y ejerciendo como terapeuta en una variedad de escenarios clínicos. Además, ha realizado investigaciones en temas relacionados a interacciones de patentes filiales y el desarrollo de desregulación emocional. La doctora Rubio Frosetti, al ser bilingüe en inglés y en español, ha trabajado con comunidades hispanas enfocándose en el acceso de servicios de salud mental. Ha realizado numerosas presentaciones que concienten problemas de la salud mental en estas comunidades, así como cuestiones de reclutamiento y retención de hispanos en niveles de educación superior. Doctora Aimida Rubio Frosetti. Okay, so my big job is to make sure you don't fall asleep right after lunch. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so, how many of you all have read Harry Potter? Yeah, right? Her wonderful, wonderful, right? And Dumbledore is one of my heroes, right? And, you know, when you think about Harry Potter, I want you to keep Harry Potter in mind as we start talking about, like, the diagnosis of BPD in you. In Harry Potter, of course, for those of you all who didn't read Harry Potter, number one, you should, it's an incredible read. Number two, in Harry Potter, the villain, Voldemort, right? everybody goes around saying, he who must not be named, he who must not be named. But at the very end, one of the things that they do that is incredibly powerful is they name Voldemort. And one of, the, one of my favorite lines is one of the professors said, I'm going to use his name because he's going to come after me anyway. And then we at least know what we are clearly dealing with. And this is true in the case of youth with borderline personality disorder. So, his, oh, what did I do? OK, wrong one. No. All right. Uh-oh. Leave it to me. Okay, so one of the things I'm going to talk about is how we have, uh -huh. All right. no, how we have managed to speak about diagnoses. There we go. Ah, yes. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the diagnosis, in particular with youth. We're going to talk about some of our current thinking about diagnosis with youth and talk about the advantages of going ahead and diagnosing in youth. And then I'll also try to address some of the questions that came up this morning with regard to what do you do when it's not fully blown BPD? How do we manage that? And I'll speak a little bit about what we do in our program, and at the end I'll actually orient you to our program at McLean in the outpatient clinic. We do have a continuum of care, and so we'll, I'll try to address some of those things as well. Okay, so historically, there has been, and this has been touched on before, there's been this reluctance to diagnose borderline in youth. There's been a reluctance in terms of the stigma associated, in terms of that it's something that is kind of a bad thing. But what happens, and it's repeatedly clear from this morning, what happens is that we miss an opportunity to actually deliver potentially effective treatments. I'm going to focus on dialectical behavior therapy, but there are other treatments as well. It's clear that there has been, for many, many years it's been clear, that there's this relationship between suicidal behaviors in youth and personality disorders in adolescents. And so one of the things that we know is that the longer it takes for us to diagnose properly, the more entrenched these behaviors become. One of the things that's clear in our program is we are never ever the first place that a family is coming to. We're usually the fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth place, the 20th provider, and these are teens of like 14 and 15 years old. So delaying just kind of gets these behaviors more and more entrenched. 
We also know that a lot of the risk factors for suicidal behaviors in adolescents also overlap with, borderline, with the criteria of borderline personality disorder. And I'm going to talk a little bit about one way that DBT conceptualizes borderline personality disorder and how that, especially for youth, it may make a lot more sense for us to conceptualize it that way than to be kind of only limited by criteria in, in the diagnostic manuals. So one of the things in terms of kind of early identification of BPD, it is clear that there isn't a magic, oh, thank you, there isn't a magic number that happens, there isn't something magical that happens when they turn 18. I was talking to somebody earlier and they said, you know, I see these same people year after year, week after week after week, and then suddenly when they're 18, then they go off and they get transferred just to the adult unit, right? And so we, we've had this kind of like, assumption that somehow we can't diagnose before 18, but we know clinically it's supported. We also know that most of the BPD adults that we deal with can speak about what they were like as an adolescent, what they were like as a child. The family this morning talked about how, you know, this had been going on 10 years, 10 years without being able to receive an, a good form of treatment. The, B, the constellation of BPD, given the number of criteria, makes it a very heterogeneous population. So that it, they can look like most of our teenagers when we see them carry, I would say, on average, about five different Axis one diagnoses. Right? They've been diagnosed as anxiety disorder, bipolar, depression, attention deficit disorder, um, all sorts of disorders. And so oftentimes, these families have run around going to specialist to specialist of I need a specialist for ADHD, I need a specialist for anxiety disorder, I need a specialist for depression. We recently had one patient who came in who had seven different providers to go along with their seven different diagnoses. Oftentimes when we speak to the parents and we go through kind of our conceptualization of borderline personality disorder, kind of assessing with them what these traits look like, parents can often recognize that these traits have been in existence for a really long time. I think sometimes one of the questions that came up was, how do we distinguish between kind of normal adolescent behavior, which can, honestly, look a little borderline-ish, right? But what's the difference between that and something that is clinically significant that we need treatment for? But often our parents talk about, like, Wow, wow, you know, I, I wish I had known about this sooner. I would have brought my child here first. And also in psychiatry, we've been not hesitant at all to diagnose children with a multitude of disorders. But again, we've been hesitant to diagnose with borderline personality disorder. Today, what we know in terms of rates of borderline with, in youth is that you know, some of the studies, some recent studies even indicate up to 5% of young adults may carry this type of diagnosis. And we recognize now that actually borderline in youth is similar to borderline in adulthood. Whereas before, we were very hesitant to even kind of say that as a possibility. Again, like, we can't say those words, right? It was the Voldemort of psychiatry, and it still is, unfortunately, with many people in the field. So one of the things that we do is we look at a cluster of behaviors, and we'll kind of go through that, in terms of cognitive behaviors, behavioral behaviors, um, emotional behaviors, that might help us kind of understand this disorder and understand what this family needs and what this child needs. And so, instead of kind of saying that this child is just acting out or this child is seeking attention, you know, they're cutting themselves, not because really something's wrong, they're just trying to get my attention, or they're trying to manipulate me, to let them go to the party, those kinds of things. We now recognize these behaviors as more skill deficits than, than something that is kind of uh, more of a moral kind of issue. So this is based on Dr. Linehan's original work, and the different areas of dysregulation, so the five areas of dysregulation, and then underneath each area of dysregulation, and we're gonna go through kind of what we see clinically with our youth in these five areas, 
underneath each one of them are the things from the diagnostic manual, are the criteria from the diagnostic manual that correspond to these different levels of dysregulation. So I'm gonna go through kind of each one and just in terms of what we see in terms of an adolescent population. When, our, um, when people contact us in our clinic, what we're doing is we're assessing around these five different areas of dysregulation. So in terms of emotion dysregulation, which we really see as kind of the core issue, and I know Alan's gonna speak more on this in a bit, um, what we tend to see are these are teenagers who they themselves and their parents report that they feel things quicker. That the parents sometimes will say, my kid knows when I'm in a bad mood, sometimes before I even know I'm in a bad mood. I'm incredibly sensitive to emotion. They tend to feel things more intensely than maybe in, if it's a family and it has multiple children, they'll say, you know, they were always a bit more sensitive than our other kids were. And they have a difficulty that when they get emotionally escalated, that they have a hard time being able to let it go, to come back from that. Now, in the diagnostic manual, the diagnostic manual often emphasizes anger as the issue. And with our teens, we certainly see sometimes angry behaviors, but actually when we speak to the teens and we do some chain analyses with the teens that have been referenced before, what we actually see is that it's often much more shame. And then they, the display, the behavioral display may look like anger, but when they actually can identify what emotions they have, it's much more likely to be shame and self-loathing than necessarily being angry, than only just being angry. In terms of interpersonal dysregulation, what we tend to see with these teens are that they, their suicide attempts are, at times, pre, after some type of emotional turbulence within a relationship, a recent breakup, a disagreement with their parents where they feel like their parents you know, may abandon them in some way, or their parents have, have kind of told them they can't continue having certain relationships because the parents are concerned about those relationships. They also alternate between kind of like idealizing their parents and their friends, thinking these are like my friends are the best, they're like so great to, you know, my friends suck and my parents suck and everything sucks and everybody sucks. And they kind of vacillate between those two. And that goes to some of the, the, di the lack of being able to have dialectical thinking. And these are teens who often have recurrent difficulty with peer groups. I would say it's actually, unfortunately, quite common that when we have the teens come in, our teens have been moved from several different schools all because of peer group issues. In terms of self-dysregulation, and here's one that I think is um, we are very careful with, because of course, in terms of identifying their own identity for teens, that is one of the tasks, right? Teens are trying on different things. They're trying on kind of what it's like to be like this versus what it's like to be like that. And so we want to distinguish between kind of that normative search by identity, that normative identity confusion with instead what sometimes what we often see is a lot of self-loathing and self-hatred in these teens. That's when it starts kind of venturing off into the, this isn't normative kind of teen adolescent identity crisis. This has much more to do with emotion dysregulation and shame. Many of our teens who kind of display this type of dysregulation are very chameleon-like. They don't only kind of try on different things, they almost virtually become other people. And they talk about how they realize that their sense of who they are is not as stable as their friends. They'll say, my friends have a much better sense of who they are, and yeah, they're trying different things out, but I really have no sense of who I am, or what that even really would feel like for me to know who I am. We also have teens who talk a lot about, in terms of self-dysregulation, where they talk about kind of being bored, and that boredom often then leads them into, develop, into um, participating in a lot of risky, either sexual behaviors or uh, substance abuse, um, those kinds of behaviors, kind of in an effort to, quote unquote, fill that boredom, which is actually a sense of loneliness and emptiness 
um, and that they're trying these certain behaviors in order to try to um, relieve that dysregulation. So in terms of behavioral dysregulation, which I think is what most people see as kind of like almost a hallmark of BPD, the suicidality, the self-injury, um, those types of things. But we also see a lot of other behaviors that are just impulsive behaviors. And sometimes these impulsive behaviors are things that have been diagnosed as, well, that child has ADHD, right? The child who has difficulty sitting still in class by the, in the school are, is, are being diagnosed as ADHD, where actually many of their behaviors, when we slow down and actually do a chain analysis with them, we quickly realize this isn't kind of stereotypical ADHD. This is much more kind of engaging in impulsive behaviors that are much more likely to come from being dysregulated. So when do they look like they have ADHD? When they're dysregulated. When are they dysregulated? They're in school with these peers that they're not getting along with and they're having chaos in those relationships and they come into class and they cannot manage that emotion. In terms of cognitive dysregulation, um, we know that in terms of some of our teams do have a trauma history and so some of the dissociative um, behaviors that we see in this disorder is apparent. Oftentimes, though, many of our teams who don't have that trauma history still appear to be cognitive dysregulated. And by that, what we tend to see is a lot of very diff a lot of difficulty in terms of being able to process thinking that isn't simply black and white. Now, again, this is where you have to be kind of very careful with if this is a teenager, this is a teen who's still developing a lot of abstract thinking skills. And even with that, what we tend to see are children are these teens who they can certainly be abstract when we're talking with them about things that aren't emotionally latent. But as soon as we start talking with them about anything that's emotionally latent, suddenly everything is black and white. They have a really hard time with that. And again, it kind of comes back to this idea that we have in DBT about emotion dysregulation being kind of this core issue for these children. Um, one of the other things that we see with these kids is that there, a lot of times these children have been diagnosed with some type of learning disability or something like that. And the thing is, is that when we, when we look at kind of their grades and stuff, they're doing just fine academically. It's, they're, they're doing just fine, but what is being kind of picked up on is this inability to think in dialectical ways. The other part where we see cognitive dysregulation is in terms of the parent and adolescent relationship and being able to kind of navigate with the parent um, and not have it be just a very black and white type of, um, in, in being very back black and white with the arguments with their parents. Okay, so um, why do we focus on DBT with adolescents? Well, there's several reasons. One, um, in terms of early intervention with the so in terms of those cognitive let me go back to the dysregulation areas um, so the five areas of dysregulation in our clinic when they come in and we're doing our intake process those five areas are what we're looking for we're looking for evidence of is this a child struggling within these five areas we do not have any firm rules about they have to meet five these five areas they have to have all five areas we look for a pattern of behavior that clearly illustrate that these children, that this child has enough difficulties across these different areas of dysregulation that all seem to kind of come back to emotion dysregulation for which DBT is very effective. So in terms of DBT with um, adolescents, we know that we're trying to intervene as early as possible. One of the things that our teams repeatedly tell us is, I wish they had taught us this stuff in school when I was like in fifth grade. That's when it would have really helped me, right? So, um, because one of the things we do, so we focus on how this is a skill deficit model, and that was something that Marie, Paul, um, and Perry mentioned this morning, and skill deficit model and building on those skills. Another reason that we kind of focus on this is that oftentimes, and Marie Paul, I think, and Perry both had kind of illustrations 
of treatment providers often feeling very hopeless in the face of these cases. You know, whispering like, oh, they have borderline, right? As if like this is some horrible thing. And often that comes from the hopelessness providers feel of, I don't know how to manage this. DBT is, has very clear treatment targets and a hierarchy to help guide the therapist on what do I focus on and how do I focus on it. The behaviors such as the impulsive behaviors that are really dangerous in terms of suicidality, self-injury, aggression, those types of things are very clear and the primary targets in DBT at the very beginning. And it is one of the empirically validated treatments that we have. And uh, tomorrow we'll hear about some others. So in terms of what our program looks like um, at McLean for the outpatient program, and again, at McLean Hospital, we do have a continuum um, of care, and I'm in the outpatient program. What we've done is we've adapted the model of DBT to include families with teens. Um, and in terms of that adaptation, we um, have used a lot of the work by Alec Miller and Jill Rathas to guide our work. Um, and also um, a lot of actually Alan's work with families. And we've also kind of changed some of the language just to make it more team friendly. Um, it's a 20 week program, so we ask for a 20 week commitment from the families. Truth be told, I would say that most of the families end up spending 30 to 40 weeks there, so they are able to extend their time. We do a treatment evaluation um, to kind of determine who, who would benefit from staying um, and how to transition care. In terms of the program itself, it has some weekly components. So the teens receive individual therapy plus teen telephone coaching with their individual therapist. And the telephone coaching is really surrounding how to utilize the skills that they're used, that they're gonna learn, how to utilize it out in the quote unquote real world. Because of course, it's all well and good for us to sit in a therapy office together and talk about like what this could look like if you use it. And that sounds really good, and that sounds really easy, but when you get out in the ocean and it's a raging hurricane, it's a little different, and you're gonna need some coaching. So we provide that coaching. We also provide family therapy with the teen and their parents, and then we have parent coaching for the teen's parents. Um, in terms of the parent coaching, the people responsible for that are, is the therapist who is leading the multifamily skills group. In the multifamily skills group, it's a skills group, has up to five families per group, and it is the teen and their parents. And it is a very skill-based group, and so what we do is we are targeting each area of dysregulation, so on the left-hand side, showing all the areas of dysregulation, and then we have mod modules that we go through to target those behaviors, to increase those behaviors. So the teen is learning how to do those skills, the parents are learning how to do those skills, they have homework to do every week, every week they come back in, they review their homework together, and, um, and then get coaching along the way. So the person, the therapist who's leading that group is the therapist who is guiding the um, teen coaching. I mean the parent coaching. Okay, so back to Voldemort. Okay, so at some point, right, when they're all kind of saying, he who must be named, my point in conclusion is gonna be that we have to name this. We have to be willing to say, yes, this teen exhibits either borderline personality disorder or at least say borderline personality disorder traits. Um, Without that, if we're not gonna be able to diagnose these children accurately, then what's going to happen is what has happened with many of our teens. Many of our teens, as I was saying, there's this one team that we had who came in who had seven different providers, all at the same time. This was a teenager. Teenager needed to be able to go to school. Needed to, I didn't know how they fit these people in. Um, but we had, without that diagnosis, you know, and the parents were doing the best they could. They found the, the specialist, the top name in the field for anxiety, the top name in the field for, you know, in their, in their living area. They were finding those kind of appropriate people. But the parents are only responding to what the diagnosis is. 
and they had gone out to look to see what is the treatment for ADHD, what is the treatment for anxiety, what is the treatment for depression. And so as professionals, if we're not providing a solid diagnosis for these families that they can understand and that we can explain, then we're not going to be able to um, provide the early intervention that these people need. And without that early intervention, what we know is that these behaviors become more and more entrenched, right? I learned to ski when I was late in life, um, and I had this great, you know, kind of first lesson, and then I went off on my own. And I was doing okay, sort of. Uh, yeah, Alan's laughing at me. I was doing okay, um, but my turns were not so good. Right? And, but I kept doing my turns the way I knew how to do my turns. Right? And so after a while, I wanted to be able to turn better because I wanted to try to keep up with my son, um, who was quickly passing me. Um, and, and so I had to go and learn it. And I really wish I had taken more lessons at the beginning instead of kind of getting entrenched in an old pattern that then when I finally got some really good lessons, to teach me how to do it differently, I was so entrenched in how I was holding my body, it took me so much longer. Right? That's these kids. That's what it's like for these kids and these families. The other thing that we say with our children um, and our teens is that oftentimes one of the treatments of choices has been you know, pharmaceuticals, where these teens are taking sometimes three, four, five medications psychotropic medications. And so with early identification, and given that we are really emphasizing these are skill deficits models, this places less of an emphasis on the psychopharmacology and more emphasis on finding psychotherapies that can be beneficial for these parents, for these parents and for these teens. Also, given that we know that it, it is a time of ma malleability, as teenagers. Teenagers are very malleable. And so intervening early, intervening while they are in the mode of really learning things, and even with our skills group, being in, our teens are actually better at doing homework than the parents are at times. They're in the mode of, yep, got homework assigned, okay, got to do it, right? Um, and so in terms of that malleability, we want to take advantage of that. And so if we can, as professionals, and as people who just interact with children, if we can promote people being able to identify and being willing to say, I believe this child has BPD traits and have them assess well, then maybe we can provide a better life for them and their outcomes and their families as well, through whether it's treatment or kind of knowledge of family connections. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, doctora. Um, ahora vamos a dejar con la compañera. She's going to present Dr. Holland. Buenas tardes. El doctor Hollander obtuvo su doctorado en Michigan State University y luego se especializó en psicología clínica de adolescentes. Es cofundador del programa de terapia conductual dialéctica Three East de McLean donde ofrece consultas a pacientes, familiares y personal. También es reconocido a nivel nacional por sus estudios sobre la causalidad y tratamiento de la autolesión y ha ofrecido conferencias a través de los Estados Unidos sobre el tema. Hace más de 40 años que ofrece tratamiento a adolescentes y sus familias. Ha ocupado numerosos puestos de liderazgo clínico en el Hospital McLean. Es miembro de la Facultad del Programa de Becas de Psiquiatría Infantil del Hospital en Massachusetts y fue reconocido como profesor del año en el 1998. El doctor Hollander también es supervisor en la clínica de capacitación e investigación en la Universidad de Washington y entrenador para el Behavior Tech, viajando a nacional e internacionalmente para capacitar a profesionales de salud mental en el programa de deber. Publicó un libro llamado Ayudando a Adolescentes que se Cortan, Entendiendo y Terminando con las Autolesiones. 
Su expertise es en niños y adolescentes con trastorno de personalidad límite. Con ustedes, el doctor Michael Pond. says nice things about me because I do not understand. <laughs> so I'm going to look for the translation. 